I do want to start in a slightly unusual place with a look at what we're doing when we ask these questions about the boundaries of moral consideration. Philosophers often make a pretty sharp distinction between normative ethics, uh, where we ask what we should do, and meta-ethics, where we ask what are we up to when we spend time working out what we should do. Now, philosophers talking about these particular matters around, I've noticed, around animal ethics, they quite often dive into the normative side and treat the meta-ethical questions as totally separate, but also approach the normative side in a way that includes what I see as an implicit commitment to a particular view on the meta-ethical side, and one that I think has problems, and problems that those those very philosophers would probably recognise if they were thinking purely about that side of it. Trying to move very fast into some basic issues here. What I have in mind here is largely the question, when we're working through a moral problem of this kind, are we uncovering hidden ethical facts, discovering how things are in this very unusual area, or are we essentially making, creating, choosing in a way not based on discovery. Are values of the kind relevant in this setting created or discovered? Now that's not a simple divide. A person might say values are created or constructed, but there's only one way to do it that's coherent. That's a kind of neo-Kantian approach to these questions. Or a person might say, um, we're choosing, but we're choosing to follow particular discoveries that were made here, so a particular blend of the two. Um, now, often there seems to be something to be said on both, on both sides. Uh, we create value systems in order to live together as a kind of conceptual and social technology, but they feel, once at least they're mature, not at all arbitrary. It feels like you can get things wrong here, and it's hard to make good sense of what it is to get things right or wrong here. Philosophy has a standard menu of options for how our language in this area might be working. Um, sort of moral philosophy textbook options, such as the idea that moral claims might be seen as attempted descriptions, they might be seen as expressions of emotion or sentiment, they might be seen as commands. I think all those standard options are not very good, roughly in the direction of being too simple. Uh, we need a kind of mixed view, but what kind of mixed view? Well, I'll quickly sketch what I think of as a sensible mixed view through a kind of historical or etiological approach, looking at how we got where we are. And this will be, of course, the quickest of sketches. I start from the idea that valuation itself is inescapable. Putting options in order, choosing between them, working out what to do, and at a large scale, working out how to live. The moral or the ethical side of life is part of this practice of evaluation, a part that relates especially, but not only, to social life, to cooperation, group cohesion, um, patterns of behaviour of that kind. Now, it's not only that, I think Jonathan Haidt has quite successfully shown that much, but it is a central part. Eventually in human history, with the development of more elaborate social life and language, Norms that began implicit are made explicit. Norms are made explicit as rules, and they thereby come into contact with reasoning and reflection. They become part of intellectual life with consistency as a constraint. The following, I think, is especially important. The role of parity claims in the justification of moral positions. Um, the kind of reasoning you see when someone says, well, if you say that about X, then you also have to say the same kind of thing about Y, because X and Y are similar in so many respects. The things I'm calling explicit principles here, uh, or that project, probably often began in a theological setting, but, theological, but theology can eventually take a back seat. And once humans can reason, reason tends to get directed on everything. The place we get to at the end of this historical process is something like this. I see our project here still as fundamentally a constructive, creative one, working out how to live, working out how we want to live, what we will value. I think that in the area of morality, free construction 
is more basic than discovery. I don't think the universe as a whole or at large gives us much guidance here. But on the other side, we are committed to reasonableness, to the social function of moral thinking, to respecting parity arguments, you know, this is comparable to that, so they should be treated similarly, and to making choices that are defensible. A moment ago, I expressed a kind of general frustration and dissatisfaction with the standard views of moral language that you'll find in moral philosophy summaries as descriptions, as commands, as expressions of sentiments. I can now add that I think moral language of the sort that we all live within is almost designed to defy the standard options that you'll have in these initial philosophical treatments. It's almost designed, socially designed to defy them for reasons that make sense, because that language is a tool for and results from the bringing of the prescriptive building side of human thought into the realm of explicit formulation, defense, and reasonableness. Uh, Simon Blackburn. Uh, the, the view I'm sketching here owes a lot to Blackburn, uh, especially his book, Ruling Passions. The difference between Blackburn's orientation and my orientation is partly that I see Simon, I can say this because he's not here and he's got no way to defend himself, I see himself as having just too much affection for David Hume. At the end of the day, Hume kind of rules Simon. Uh, Simon is the slave of the Hume. And I'm less of a Humean than that. Uh, for those of you who sort of are familiar with the names, f there's more hair than Hume in, in my picture of things. Okay, with all that on the table as a kind of overture, um, here is our problem again, re-expressed. As part of our continually evolving relationships with animals, domestic animals, wild animals, ecosystems, also plants, microorganisms, how might we reasonably establish or re-establish boundaries relating to whose well-being is given some weight, some consideration in our decisions? And what kind of well-being uh, matters and what kind of weight might it have? So that's that's a reformulation of, of the project. And I'm going to start with a look at sentience. This is the least controversial feature with respect to moral consideration. Uh, sentience in the sense of subjective experience, but particularly of a kind that involves pleasure and pain, affective or evaluative experience. And many moral views converge to some extent on the importance of this. Here, recently, a shift has come about through broadly empirical considerations rather than philosophical ones. Basically, it looks like there's a lot more sentience around than had been supposed in the animal kingdom. Now, crustaceans and cephalopods are the clear cases where previous views had sort of tacitly assumed none, but the evidence is now quite good. I have in mind especially um, I mean, these two papers really are exemplars for me. On the octopus side, when I wrote Other Minds, a book about octopuses, I said a little bit about octopus pain, but in a pretty cautious way. Since then, this paper by Robin Crook, I think has added a great deal to the case that octopuses can, in some circumstances, feel pain. On the crustacean side, I think Robert Elwood's work is really exemplary here. Um, and in both cases, there's a kind of sophistication and integration in the handling of aversive events by the animals that strongly suggests the presence of something like pain. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas. For more debates, talks, and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.